Well, as you see, today is the last Sunday of choir, so I'm going to preach shorter. I always say that, and actually this time I'm intent on preaching shorter. <laughs> I always tell you, oh, it's a busy day, I'm going to preach less, and then I don't. Uh, the first thing I wanted to say was thank you all for our visit with the Japanese. That was an incredible week. You know, for 15 years, Fumi and Pastor Tottenham had been praying and planting seeds, and they really felt after this last trip that the fruit is coming. It had already been growing, but now there's a huge harvest. And so you're going to see God blessing that, and I want to thank everyone who was a part of that. And we were able to use some money we had set aside even some years ago uh, to help do that. And so thank you for your generosity in making that happen. Um, many of you have heard about Jim Kavner, and Tom, thanks for calling this morning too. Um, he had a major, major medical event that required emergency surgery. He, the surgery went better than expected in terms of the time and uh, the intensity, but he's still in uh, the ICU, and we're praying for him and for his heart, especially after the loss of Marilyn and for their children after what they've experienced. So here's the short sermon. Uh, last night we were at the Angels game, which itself is a form of spiritual punishment, you know, if you... <laughs> and I went to get food. Now, you have two choices. You can either go to a really nice restaurant in Huntington Beach, or for the same prices, you can buy hot dogs and nachos at... Angel Stadium. And so I was there, and the woman who was serving me was an older black woman. And she said, how are you today? I said, I'm good. How are you? She says, oh, I'm blessed. And I went, oh. I go, oh, she's a Christian, because you can tell. So I said, well, I'm actually blessed too. And she goes, oh. And then she goes, she goes you don't want to buy these nachos. She said, they're better down the, the path, you know. And I said, well, we already, we already waited in line. You know, I want to wait. I'll take the, we'll take the cheaper nachos. And she goes, okay, but they're better down there. And, uh, and then I tell her, you know, we're talking about faith. Because then I said, well, I'm a pastor. And she says, oh, I love that. You're a pastor. And I said, on Huntington Beach. And I said, where do you fellowship? And she said, I fellowship at a church in Pomona. Uh, and by the time we leave, after the credit card transaction, because she talks about our boys, and um, the last thing I said to her, I said, well, I'll see you in the kingdom. And then she goes, I'll see you on the other side. And then we, I'll never see her again, I don't think. I don't want to go back to another Angels game, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, but how is it possible that two strangers, I mean, literally we were talking about the price and quality of nachos. And how is it possible then that two strangers from two very different backgrounds are able to connect and feel that they belong to something ancient but also future? And it's exactly what Jesus meant in the gospel this morning when he said... My brother, my brothers, and my mother are the people that do God's will. Meaning, part of belonging to the Christian faith is belonging to a large family that you weren't born into and you didn't choose, but rather when God chose you, God connected you to all these people. And it's part of the disorienting vulnerability of faith because it's going to re-establish living your life on two vertices. One is the horizontal, living with each other, and the other is the vertical, living with God. And because of God and what God's done for us and Jesus being primary, it changes our relationship to each other. But you'll notice that when Jesus starts living this out as he's living out his mission, people think he's crazy. Now, part of this is the wonderful gift of faith because oftentimes you have been reduced in your existence. You know, especially in modern society that lost a lot of its traditional moorings, and by that I mean some of its rituals of coming of age and aging and, you know, work and you know, everything got all mixed up over the last couple hundred years. Uh, really, many of the traditions that we pass on can be reduced to either materialism, just go get a bunch of stuff, hedonism, just go pursue a bunch of pleasure, um, or narcissism, you know, you have to look out for number one even if it hurts other people. You know, you're only here for a short time and you might as well use it. And oftentimes those three things overlap. Or you get reduced to your role. What kind of work do you do? What's your job? And when you can't do your job, you go, well, I guess I'm not useful anymore. There's nothing for me to do. You get reduced to your role or your history. What are the things you've done? Well, that's, you know, that's who you are because of what you've done. And there's always this remainder of like, no, there feels like there's something in me that's hungering for more reaching out for more, and that reaching out for more is the gift of the family that God reestablishes in Jesus. But literally, it feels crazy. That's why they say, they go to Mary and the family, and they go, we think Jesus has gone crazy. Listen to what he's saying. 
He's opening up this new horizon. We thought our life was going to be kept under this shell, and he's opening up this new horizon for us to participate in. And what he's doing is he's healing and restoring what was broken in that reading from Genesis. Now, in some ways, it's so unfair to you that this is the Sunday of a short sermon because that chapter in Genesis and those first three chapters in Genesis are so primary to our understanding of what it means to belong to the family of God. <clears throat> they are these stories and this wisdom and this beauty uh, that becomes true for every generation. Why are we the way we are? So by the time we get to this part in the story, they've already crossed that boundary that love has set. You know, sometimes people think, they go, well, why would God put a tree like that in the garden? That doesn't seem fair. It feels like God's entrapping them. You know, like you watch those videos where the police leave out a bike that the police want you to steal so they can arrest you. But that's missing the point. The point isn't that God is entrapping them. The point is that love set a boundary saying, if we're going to do this together, there are certain things you can't do. Like if you live near an electrical substation, none of you go, that's so unfair they put that by my house. I want to play in there. Because you know you can't play in there, you'll get electrocuted. But no one complains to the electric company, but we complain to God all the time saying, why would you do that? Why would you set a boundary on our love? And it's like, well, that's what's going to make love and trust possible. And in fact, it's less so the fruit than the action of crossing that boundary and picking the fruit and eating it. And you'll notice it reduces them. That's where the process of reduction begins. They get reduced to an animalistic fear. If you've ever been somewhere and you go, wait, what was that sound? Well, what is that? Have you heard that? You're at home and you go, what was that? Or you're out walking in the woods. You get reduced to an animal because you think you're being hunted. That's what they're doing. Do you hear that sound? Now it's not the sound of love approaching them, even though that's what it is. They experience it as a kind of animalistic fear, something that they want to protect themselves from. I did uh, the last show with my high school kids this week, and one of the kids got up at the end and read a very lovely note from the class. And she's my student that's had cancer ever since she was a little girl. She's, she's had a chronic cancer that they can manage, uh, but she'll have it the rest of her life. And I was talking to her mother after the show, and I said, you know, your daughter, I said, she's been so open about that, and you know, she's been able to use that to create some of her art. And her mother said, you know, one time when she was a little girl, uh, another mother came up to me, and she said, uh, I don't think our daughters can be friends anymore. <clears throat> and I said, why not? And she says, well, your daughter has cancer, and if she dies, I don't want my daughter to have to go through that. And she went, what? Why would you tell me that? You know, so then we kind of said, why would a person say that? Well, the reason a person would say that is they're very much like Adam and Eve. They're hiding. They're wanting to hide from suffering. They're wanting to hide from pain. They're wanting to hide from the reality of a world that's broken. So the behavior of these two, you'll notice that love is always inviting us into a kind of responsibility taking a kind of internal ownership. We are responsible. We are responsible for each other. We are responsible for ourselves. We are responsible for living out this faith by the power of the Holy Spirit. And you'll notice that one of the signs of this animalistic fearfulness is being unwilling to take responsibility. Who did this? Well, I didn't do it. She did it. Well, I didn't do it. It was the snake that did it. It's this constant deflection that doesn't allow for trust and honesty and real relationship. And so when Jesus goes about doing this work, Jesus is restoring the possibility of this communion that had been broken. And you'll notice that part of the restoration is expunging the demonic. And I've told you before that a great ancient definition of the demonic in the early church was knowledge without love. The demons all know who Jesus are. They know what he can do. They know where he's from, but they do not love him. Adam and Eve know who the Father is know who the Spirit is, walk with Jesus in the garden, the Holy Trinity. They know him, but now they don't love him. They're afraid of him. And that's why we hear in the New Testament that love pushes out fear. We don't have to be afraid. There's a restoration of this sort of bold trust that we can live in. And so the wonderful gift, and this is where I'll end, which I can't believe I'm ending, <laughs> uh, but the, <laughs> the wonderful gift is already in this moment of great sadness, in this moment of brokenness, you can already hear Jesus on the cross saying, I thirst. I thirst for this to be restored. I thirst for this to be renewed. And it's going to take the cross as the final expunging of this animalistic fear that results in violence. Uh, and already God is planting the seeds of redemption. When God is talking about the snake and saying, you will strike his heel, he will crush your head. 
And this is a very powerful theme in Christian art where you see Adam, or excuse me, actually you see Eve and Mary talking to each other and there's a snake wrapping around Eve's uh, leg and Mary's crushing it under her foot because the, and she's pregnant with the child Jesus and the child Jesus is going to be the snake crusher. But he's going to pay with his life. And so already God has come to crush fear. God has come to crush venom. God has come to crush that poison which allowed us to live in fear of one another, mutual distrust, also violence to resist each other and the unwillingness to belong to each other. And he opens up this possibility of going to an angel's game or anywhere else and saying, well, we'll see you in the kingdom. Amen.